1946 was baseball's banner year. Never before has fan enthusiasm reached such heights. The turnstiles of the major league parks turned more than 18 million times during the season. Attendance that smashed records everywhere. Detroit. Briggs Stadium admitted more than 1,700,000 to see the Tigers play. Chicago, the Cubs drew more than 1,300,000 rabid baseball fans. Brooklyn, Ebbets Field seated more than 1,700,000 during the season. And New York, where over 2,200,000 watched the games at Yankee Stadium. 47 million paid admissions to professional baseball in 1946. More than ever before, baseball was truly America's national game. With the season well along and the World Series not far off, national interest turned to Boston's Fenway Park on July the 9th, when a capacity crowd filled the park to see the pick of the major leagues in the 13th annual All-Star Game. Here is the starting infield for the National League team. Whitey Karofsky, third base, Marty Marion, shortstop, Al Shane Dietz, second base, and Johnny Mize, first base. And for the American League team, the starting infield, Ken Keltner, third base, Johnny Pesky, shortstop, Bobby Doerr, second base, and Mickey Vernon, first base. And the opposing pitchers, Bob Feller, strikeout king of the majors, and Claude Passaw, dependable right-hander of the Chicago Cubs. In the National League part of the first inning, Red Shane Deanst grounded out to Vernon. In the American League half with two men out, Williams walked. Then Charlie Keller of the Yankees came to bat. Here's the pitch. And Keller connects for a long drive into the right field bullpen. A home run wallop that scored Williams ahead of him, making the score two to nothing for the American League All-Star team. In the American League fourth with Higby pitching. Williams wallops a tremendous drive into the center field bleachers. A home run for the third tally of the game. In the American League eight, Rip Sewell was on the mound facing Ted Williams with runners on first and second and two men away. Rip threw Williams his famous blooper pitch. Let's take a look at the height of that blooper pitch. Ted stepped into it and slammed it out of the park for his second home run of the game, scoring Kramer and Stevens ahead of him. When Verbin, batting for Karofsky, fouled to catcher Wagner for the third out of the ninth inning, the American League All-Stars were victorious over the National League All-Stars by a score of 12 to nothing. Behind the capable pitching of Kramer, Feller, and Neuhauser. The 43rd World Series started in St. Louis, and the fans who had followed the Cardinals to their league victory filled Sportsman's Park to capacity to view the classic. While they're arriving, let's take a look around and see who's here. There's Ford Frick, president of the National League, in the best of spirits. And here are Horace Stoneham, president and owner of the New York Giants, Mel Ott, who managed the Giants through the season, and secretary, Eddie Brenny. And here's a twosome from the Cincinnati Reds, general manager Warren Giles, and his newly appointed manager, Johnny Noon. National League rooters are certainly out strong today. Here's jovial Bob Lewis, traveling secretary of the Chicago Cubs, and the Cubs manager, Charlie Grimm, with Herb Pennock, vice president of the Philadelphia Phillies, and a couple of American leaguers, Tom Yawkey, owner of the Boston Red Sox, with his vice president, Eddie Collins. But things are starting to happen out on the field now. Let's see what's going on. Joe Cronin, manager of the Boston Red Sox, has selected for his starting pitcher, Tex Hewson, his right-handed fastball twirler, who won 20 games during the season. And Eddie Dyer, the Cardinals manager, has chosen Howie Paulette, the slim left-hander, winner of 20 games during the pennant race. While these pitchers are warming up, let's have a look at the starting lineups for the Boston Red Sox. McBride, right field. Pesky, shortstop. DiMaggio, center field. Williams, 
left field. York, first base. Dorr, second base. Higgins, third base. Wagner, catching. Hewson, pitching. And the lineup for the St. Louis Cardinals. Al Shandienst, second base. Terry Moore, center field. Stan Musial, first base. Enos Slaughter, right field. Whitey Karaski, third base. Joe Graziola, catching. Harry Walker, left field. Marty Marion, shortstop. And Howie Pollitt, pitching. With their team set for battle, the rival managers get together for a final handshake. And the umpires settle the last of the ground rules, and the big moment is at hand. Now Commissioner Chandler throws out the first ball, and it's... Play ball! The 1946 World Series is on. In the first inning, McBride grounded to Karofsky and was thrown out at first. In the second inning, the entire Cardinal infield, with the exception of the shortstop, shifted toward the right as the defense against the renowned Williams. Ted grounded sharply to Shane Deans, and the Cardinals' strategy seemed perfect. After York was hit by a pitch ball and Dorr walked, Higgins came up with two on bases. He slammed a single to right center, scoring York and sending Dorr to third. The Red Sox lead one to nothing. The Cardinals tied the score in the last half of the sixth. With a teammate on second and two out, Musial doubled off the right field wall, scoring Shane Deans. With two out in the Cardinal late and no one on base, Karofsky singled to left. The big break for St. Louis came when Dom DiMaggio lost Joe Garagiola's long fly in the late afternoon haze, and the ball got away from him for a two-base hit. The hero of Italian Hill in St. Louis was out at third to retire the side just a moment before Karofsky had crossed the plate. However, both umpires, Lee Ballenfant and Charlie Berry, permitted the run to count as Pinky Higgins, Red Sox third baseman, had obstructed Karofsky as he passed third base. This put the Cardinals in front, two to one. In the first half of the ninth inning for the Red Sox with one out, Higgins singled sharply to left field. Glenn Russell batting for Wagner, followed with a single to center. And the speedy Don Gutteridge, who was put in to run for Higgins, advanced to third. Catcher Roy Partee batted for Hewson and fanned. The cards at this point were within one pitch of victory. Then Tom McBride drove one through the infield to left, scoring Gutteridge and tying up the old ball game with two runs each. Here we are in the Red Sox tent, one of those rare extra inning games in World Series play. With the game deadlocked at two and two, two out in the first half of the 10th inning, York drove a pitch from the Cardinal left-hander Howie Paulette high and far into the left field bleachers. The knockout blast was a devastating blow from the bat of Rudy York. This put the Red Sox in front, three to two. In the Cardinal 10th, with Shane Deanst on third and two men out, Slaughter flied to right field and the first game of the 1946 World Series was in the Red Sox bag after 10 innings of play by a score of 3 to 2. Today the Red Sox get ready for the second game of the World Series in St. Louis. Boston's starting pitcher is going to be Mickey Harris winner of 17 games during the American League pennant race. And the St. Louis starter will be Harry Brakeen, who was Eddie Dyer's money pitcher in the latter part of the season. There was no scoring until the Cardinals third, when the young catcher, Del Rice, lined a pitch off Harris for a double into left field. When Joaquin looped the single into right field, scoring Rice, the Cardinals are in front, one to nothing. Going into the Cardinals' fifth, Rice singled the left center. Joaquin bunted. 
When Higgins' throw went past Pesky's outstretched glove, Rice reached third and Brakeen second. After Shane Deans was out, Terry Moore singled off a Doris glove, scoring Rice. Brakeen stopped at third. Musial forced Moore, Dora to Pesky, and Brakeen scored run number three for the Cardinals. In the last of the ninth for the Red Sox, DiMaggio beat out a hit down the third baseline. After Williams and York had been retired, Dorr flied to Walker in left field. And it was Brakeen's first World Series scalp by a score of three to nothing, since he whipped the Browns handily in the all St. Louis series two years ago. The Boston Red Sox came home for the third game, home to Fenway Park for the first World Series game that field has seen in 28 years. Well, here's the stranger in Fenway Park, Sam Braden, president and principal owner of the Cardinals, eager to see his team follow up their last victory. And here are a couple of off-season pals from rival leagues, Leo DeRocher, capable manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and Joe DiMaggio, the New York Yankees star center fielder. And no World Series would be complete without the president of the American League, William Herridge, seen here chatting with a young Red Sox baseball enthusiast. Here's the Cardinals starting pitcher warming up, the sturdy little right-hander, Murray Dixon. Against him on the mound for Boston will be the crack American League sophomore from Shaw, Mississippi, Dave Boo Ferris, pitching the reach ball which has always been the official ball of the American League. Everything's ready, and up in the press box, the big league sports writers are waiting to flash the game reports to the four corners of the earth. In the Red Sox half with one out, Pesky single to left. After DiMaggio was retired, Williams was passed purposely. This brings the sturdy son of the Southland, Rudy York to bat. Here's the pitch, and there it goes, a long home run drive into the left field screen, scoring Pesky and Williams ahead of him, and putting the Red Sox in front in the very first inning, three to nothing. In the last of the third, Williams crossed up the dire strategy by bunting safely down the third baseline. After this, Karofsky remained in his third base position. The Cardinals threatened in the sixth, when pitcher Dixon doubled to the left field corner. But DiMaggio came in fast for a catch of Shane Dean's short fly and doubled Dixon off a second. With two out in the Cardinal ninth, there was still hope when Stan Musial lined a triple to the far right center field corner of the park. He was left stranded when Ina Slaughter struck out to end the ball game. Game number three meant victory number two for the Red Sox by a score of four to nothing. The starting pitcher for St. Louis is Big George Munger, an Army lieutenant up until August of 1946. Tex Houston was sent back by the Red Sox for his second try for a World Series victory. The first inning was quiet, but the Cardinals leadoff man in the second, Ina Slaughter, fired the opening shot when he belted a 380-foot homer into the right field stands. Whitey Karoski followed with a double against the left field wall. After Gary Giola was out, Harry Walker singled to right, scoring Karoski with run number two. After Shane Deans singled in the third, Hewson threw Wilde to first on Moore's sacrifice. Shane Deans going to third, and Moore to second on the error. Musio followed with a double to right center, scoring Shane Deans and Moore. At this point, Manager Cronin decided to replace Houston as Red Sox pitcher, and another right-hander, Jim Bagby, came in to take over the pitching chores. In the Red Sox half of the fourth, Ted Williams singled to right field.
and Rudy York followed with a solid smash to right center field for two bases. Williams scored the first Red Sox run of the ball game. Going into the Cardinal fifth with one out, Slaughter doubled high off the left field wall. Whitey Karosky followed with a two base hit to the same section, scoring Slaughter. Score seven to one, Cardinals. Here we are in the last of the eighth, with the Red Sox trailing by seven runs. With DiMaggio on first and two away. Bobby Doerr lined one of Munger's pitches over the left field wall for a two-run homer. Now the score was eight to three. But the Cardinals weren't through. In their ninth, Slaughter singled the center. Karofsky bunted safely toward third. When Higgins threw wild the first, Slaughter reached third. Gary Giola followed with a single to right, scoring Slaughter. This was enough for Mace Brown, the fourth Red Sox pitcher, to leave the game. He was replaced by the veteran right-hander, Mike Reba. Going into the Red Sox ninth with two out, Wally Moses got an infield hit when he grounded to Musial and beat the toss to Munger, who covered first. Shortstop Pesky grounded out to end the ball game, and the scoreboard read St. Louis Cardinals 12, Boston Red Sox 3. The Redbirds had humbled the Boss Sox with a 20-hit barrage, a scoring melee that tied a World Series record established 25 years ago. These three, Ina Slaughter, Whitey Karoski, and young Joe Garagiola, joined the exclusive club of ballplayers who have made four hits in one World Series game. To give the Red Sox a bit of comfort, Wally Moses wrapped out four hits joining 22 others who have collected four World Series hits in one game prior to 1946. The Cardinal manager, Eddie Dyer, will try to get his talented southpaw, Howie Paulette, through another game. And for Boston, the starting pitcher will be Joe Dobson, 200-pound Oklahoman, a right-hander with a fine assortment of pitching wares. The Red Sox opened their half when Gutteridge singled. Then Pesky lined a base hit to right field. After DiMaggio forced Gutteridge out at third, Williams singled sharply to right, scoring Pesky, sending DiMaggio to third. Ted took second on the throw to the plate. Three of the first four Red Sox hitters had landed on Paulette for line hits, and so Dyer removed him from the game at this point. His back was still taped, and it was evident that he wasn't right. Alpha Brazel, the sandy-haired Oklahoman, followed Paulette and retired the side without further scoring. The Cardinals tied it up in the second when Garagiola had reached second on Pesky's error, and Walker doubled down the left field line, scoring Garagiola. In the last half of the second, the Red Sox catcher Partee singled to center. Dobson bunted, and when Karoski threw late to second, both runners were safe. Don Gutteridge, filling in for Bobby Doerr, single to center, scoring Partee. And this put the Red Sox back into the lead, two to one. After Pesky was out, DiMaggio ended the inning by hitting into a double play. In the Boston sixth, Lee Culbertson is the hitter. Brazel takes the signal. Culbertson times one solidly for a home run over the left field wall, making the score three to one for the Red Sox. Now the Cardinals are up for their last try in the night. With runners on second and third and two away, Perry Walker dropped a single over second base, scoring Musial and Karoski. Shortstop Marion popped to Pesky for the final out. The Red Sox had bounced right back to defeat the Cardinals in the fifth and final game of the series in Boston by a six to three count. in St. Louis at Sportsman's Park again for the sixth game of the World Series play. Manager Joe Cronin has decided to give his star left-hander, Mickey Harris, a chance to avenge his first defeat at the hands of the Cardinals. 
while the Cardinal manager, Eddie Dyer, will shoot the works with his pitching ace, the nimble left-hander, Harry Brookeen. Now it's play ball again. In the last of the third for the Cardinals, their catcher, Del Rice, singled the left center. After Rice was forced at second on Brookeen's bunt, Shane Dink doubled over first, Brookeen stopping at third. Terry Moore followed with a long fly to Culbertson, Brookeen scoring after the catch. Here's the turning point of the ball game. The speedy Stan Musial beats out a grounder to Pesky for a base hit. Third baseman Karoski singles sharply to left, scoring Shane Deans. Slaughter kept up the rally with a base hit to center. Musial scoring and Karoski going to third. In this inning, when the Cards bunched five of their eight hits to take a three to nothing lead over the Red Sox, Tex Hewson replaced Harris on the mound. This brings us up to the Red Sox seventh with big Rudy York as the hitter. Rakeen gets set on the mound, winds up. York wallops a long drive to center field where Terry Moore just misses making a sensational catch off the center field wall. York pulls up at third base with a triple to his credit. Bobby Doerr follows with a long fly to Walker in left field and York scores easily after the catch, making the score Cardinals three, Red Sox one. Harry Bakeen was going great guns on the mound for the Cardinals. In the eighth inning with one away, Culbertson was called out on strikes. Johnny Pesky also took a third strike to retire the side. In the Red Sox ninth with one out, Williams singled to right, but Rudy York hit into a double play to end the game. With the Cardinals, the victors in game number six by a score of four to one. The eyes of the sporting world were on Sportsman's Park for game number seven. Within a couple of hours, either the St. Louis Cardinals or the Boston Red Sox will be the 1946 baseball champions of the world. Boston star right-hander Dave Ferris is warming up as starting pitcher for the Red Sox. He's out for his second victory in the series. Over on the Cardinals side, the little right-hander Murray Dixon will start on the pitcher's mound. Here he is warming up with the Spalding Ball, official in all National League play for more than 70 years. Stan Musial, National League batting champion, and his teammate, Ina Slaughter, who led both major leagues in runs batted in, are getting their famous Louisville Sluggers warmed up for the seventh game. Play ball! In the first inning, when Wally Moses singled a center, it looked as though the Red Sox were not to be denied. Johnny Pesky followed with a bounder that got past Marion into center field for a base hit. Moses reached third with no one out. Then DiMaggio lifted a long fly to slaughter to right field. Moses scoring after the catch, putting the Red Sox in front, one to nothing. When Moore went far to his right in center field for Williams' long fly, the danger for the Cards was over in the inning. Whitey Karowski led off the Cardinals' second inning with a rousing double to left center. After Dorr threw out Garagiola, Walker lined to Williams in left center, and Karowski scored after the catch to tie the ball game at one and one. In the last of the fifth, Walker singled into center field for the Cardinals. Marion sacrificed his teammate to second. When pitcher Murray Dixon doubled over Higgins' head into left field, Walker scored the run that put the Cardinals ahead two to one. Shane Deanst followed with a base hit to center field, scoring Dixon with run number three. When Moore singled to center, Shane Deanst stopping at second, that was enough for Boo Ferris. The right-handed Joe Dobson is the new pitcher for the Red Sox, with the Cardinals leading 3-1. to one. With the Red Sox still trailing in the eighth, 
There was little time left for action. Manager Cronin sent in pinch hitter Glenn Russell to bat for Wagner, and he singled to center field. Another pinch hitter for Dobson, the left-handed batter, George Metkovich, who promptly doubled to left field, Russell stopping at third. This left runners on second and third with none out in the eighth inning. Manager Eddie Dyer called time. Harry Burkeen is brought into the game at this point to replace Murray Dixon. Burkeen swings into a windup, and his third pitch to Wally Moses is a call strike. After Pesky was retired on a fly to slaughter, both runners holding their base, DiMaggio is at the plate. With a count of three and one, he lines a base hit off the right center field wall over Slaughter's head for two bases, scoring Russell and Metkovich with the tying runs. Now the score is three to three. Manager Cronin sent Bob Klinger in to pitch for Boston in the Cardinal eight. Ina Slaughter, the first batter to face him, singles sharply to center field. Attempting to bunt, Karofsky popped to Klinger. Del Rice then flied to Williams, with Slaughter still on first and two men away. This brings up Harry Walker, a timely hitter during the series. Slaughter is off of the pitch. Walker swings and lines a double to left center. Slaughter kept on going, rounding third base at full speed, scoring all the way from first, when the relay throw from Johnny Pesky reached home too late for a play on Slaughter. This important run put the Cardinals out in front by a score of four to three. The Red Sox were still battling in the ninth. The first hitter, Rudy York, won up the base hit to left. Campbell ran for York. And then Bobby Doerr singled to left. Campbell stopping at second. Higgins forced Doerr at second on an attempted sacrifice, leaving runners on first and third with one man out. When the Red Sox catcher Roy Partee fouled to Musial, the Cardinal players started to breathe a little easier. This brought up a Red Sox pinch hitter, Tom McBride, batting for pitcher Johnson. Rakeen eyes the batter carefully. There goes a screwball pitch. McBride grounds to Shane Beast, and Higgins is forced out at second to end the ball game, with the St. Louis Cardinals winning the seventh and final game of the 1946 World Series by a score of four to three. It was the sixth time in their nine World Series appearances since 1926 that baseball's highest honor has gone to the St. Louis Cardinals. The Cards also distinguished themselves by winning for the fourth time in a series that went the limit. The victory was no one man's success. It was a triumph for mass spirit and team skill, for cooperation and determination. But still the series had its individual heroes. For the Cardinals, Captain Terry Moore gave a display of center field prowess such as only he can do. Enos Slaughter, the great Cardinal right fielder, provided one of the highlights of the series in hitting, running, and throwing. The two young catchers, Joe Garagiola and Del Rice, were magnificent. Between them, they totaled nine hits. And Stan Musial, five of his six hits were for extra bases. Another Cardinal standout, Harry Walker, the leading hitter of the series with a mark of 4-12. For the Red Sox, second baseman Bobby Doerr was brilliant in the field and batted 4-09. And more laurels for the big first baseman of the Red Sox, Rudy York, whose home runs won Boston's first two victories. Among the pitchers, Dave Ferris starred with his 4 to nothing shutout score. And pitcher Joe Dobson did fine work on the mound for Boston. But top performer throughout the entire series was Harry Brookeen. Brookeen, the cat, with the heart of a lion. He not only tied the record for pitching the most victories in World Series play, but he is the first southpaw ever to accomplish that feat. He's the first pitcher to win three World Series victories since 1920. Now Sportsman's Park empties and another baseball season has come to an end. During the winter months, this series will be played over and over again. For well, this film will take the series to American troops in occupied territory around the globe, as well as to millions of fans here at home. And we'll be back again next year with exciting games, play by play, old stars back, and new ones coming up to keep baseball our national game.